All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, I really hope that fixed it. I restarted everything. If it continues to give us issues, I will record it um, not live and make sure you all get the recording. So I'm going to start over briefly say the same thing so I get the recording for other folks who couldn't join us. Um, but thank you so much for joining tonight. Because we're so close to the, the giving holiday, I wanted to talk about what we as ABR and an organization collectively are thankful for this year. And we have much to be thankful for, even though we recently gone through quite a great ordeal, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the bacteria outbreak that hit our facility. So you can see here this scary headline, deadly and merciless Appalachian bear rescue bears facing deadly disease. And uh, it was right to be scary. The headline was rightfully so scary. You can see all these other scary headlines about um, be it being a terrible roller coaster ride and these severe cases of infection. And again, all of these headlines were happening uh, back to back, it seemed like, for a couple weeks on end last month. And all of these were happening, again, rightfully so, because our bears were very, very sick. And Next to all these headlines, though, were these wonderful and supportive, heartfelt comments from all of you, our wonderful supporters and our wonderful friends. And these screenshots are all from one post. Um, I didn't have to go searching for any of these great comments. You guys just continue to give us them on every single post that we did, which we gave about two a day back then when we were in the height of it. And um, so one of the things we're most thankful for this year is you all, all of your support, not only your financial support, which you have given greatly, but also all the notes, emails. Dana received quite a few phone calls as well, comments, as well as goodies that were mailed to us. I received a tin of cookies in Michigan, which was just so kind. And then we also even had a counselor reach out and offer their services for curators and staff due to losing and going through this loss and mourning period of the, the wildlife at our facility. So just absolutely magnificent um, of all of you and our community and the public from near and far supporting us during, during this time and to this day. And so we are so, so thankful for all of you. Now in the last bear tracks, and you all are members, so you should have gotten the bear tracks. It was very, very late for October. And I apologize that was due to all of the things happening with the bacteria outbreak. I was very late to the game on getting that out to you. But you might remember that I sort of laid out a very broad timeline of everything that took place. And when I did that for the bear tracks, I kind of looked back and and was like, wow, this really happened so quickly within, you know, like exactly a month and then turned around. And now we have Twinkle Bear and it's kind of like back to business. And it's crazy to look back at, at what actually happened and kind of uh, digest it. We're still getting all of our veterinary records organized. We haven't received results back from many things. So I know there will be a lot of questions that I probably can't answer tonight, but I did just kind of want to share with you sort of that whirlwind that I know many of you were on with us through the last month and then bring us to the end where we our next thing we're thankful for is that we do have three bears that survived it and seem to be on the other side of it now. So we'll start with day zero. Um, COVID probably familiarized us all with this, this uh, first day of symptoms of an outbreak. Day zero really started on, on October 3rd. And this is when curators noticed Flapjack breathing weird on cameras. Now, when we say breathing weird, um, it's hard to describe. And so I did include a video I don't think we've shared before. Um, it might be kind of hard to watch just because we know what the outcome of, of Flapjack. Of course, he was the first that passed. But I want to share with you all what we saw uh, as curators on our camera system. So you can see it just looks off, um, sort of heaving, wheezing, if you will. Um, but he was still doing normal bear things. You can see he's on the ground here. He was up on the platform that day. He was able to climb up and down. And so the decision was made to either try and trap him for veterinary exam or to dart and immobilize him for veterinary exam. But either way, the decision, we knew we were, he was going to need to be see, seen by vets as we had sent the vets this video, and they were also concerned. The thing about immobilization and sedation is that it can cause 
more stress on the body, especially stress with respiratory things. And so we were nervous about just straight going to darting if there was a chance we could trap him. Of course, we had no idea the severity of it at this time. Um, So we did try to first begin trapping him in the acclimation pen. Now for the next couple of days, um, so here's our acclimation pen. This was baited with really yummy food. He was not interested at all, would not go near it. And like I mentioned in the previous slide, this is him here. Um, He was still acting pretty normal. He went down to the pool. He drank. He splashed his head in the water. The other bears kind of batted around with him a little bit. This is, I was on the cameras actually zooming in this day to, to make sure this was flapjack we're looking at. Um, One of the other cubs comes up and tries to start playing with him. So again, he wasn't just laying there motionless. um, And so we still were hoping that it maybe wasn't that severe. um, And that that's why we didn't, again, go right for the darting, the sedation, because of the risks that that could entail as well. However, by the six, it was decided that um, we needed to intervene. His breathing had not improved and he was not showing any interest in being trapped at all. He was staying very far away from the acclimation pen, did not even go near it. Um, So we decided to go ahead and and intervene. And so here we have Ranger um, Greg, or Ryan, sorry, rather, Ranger Ryan Williamson from National Park Service. He came and helped dart and immobilize Flapjack. And then this picture here really just shows we had sort of an emergency vet station set up in our release building. This um, release building looks familiar, probably. This is where we work up our bears before they get released back into the wild. So you can see Flapjack here, all these wonderful vets working on him. He's got, they brought their portable x-ray machine. They had everything there for sort of an emergency field station at our facility and they came to us which was amazing and then of course the findings were not great so this is his um radiograph i am not a pathologist or a veterinarian so i will say throughout this presentation there's probably some questions you might have that i just don't know the answer to or the biology behind um kind of like this radiograph here. I know it's not, it doesn't look how it's supposed to, but I can't explain more than that really. Uh, he had throat lesions. So similar to what we would expect maybe to see in a person who has a uh, strep that humans get. And we'll get to that a little bit later. He had really or- thick oral mucousy discharge that they drained from his lungs. His lungs were very loud um, and he had severe pneumonia in both lungs was ultimately the diagnosis. How he got pneumonia or where that pneumonia came from was the big question. So he got through his exam. They drained his lungs. They had a treatment plan for him, antibiotics, everything. The whole nine yards seems to be going well. And as he was coming out of sedation, he did stop breathing. And veterinarians were absolutely amazing, jumped right onto it and noticed as soon as it happened They did administer emergency drugs and chest compressions, but he could not be resuscitated, unfortunately. And so that's when we lost our first bear on October 6th, three days after initially seeing any sign of anything being wrong. So veterinarians now knowing it was severe pneumonia were worried about the remaining five bears in the enclosure, enclosure four, because they weren't sure again how that pneumonia came about, if it was viral, if it was bacterial. Flapjack was sent for an emergency necropsy, and so uh, we were went about the next day immediately trying to trap the rest of the cubs in enclosure four. This was a long day. I wasn't there in person, so I take no credit for this at all, but our curators and board members and um, and director Dana worked for probably 14 to 15 hours straight that day to get the rest of the bears trapped and take them one by one to UT in Knoxville, which is about 45 minutes from our facility. So they did get them successfully trapped and transported. Thumper, however, was about halfway in the transport crate, decided he wasn't interested in what was happening, and he did quickly uh, escape the transport crate. And so everybody except Thumper on the 7th was taken and evaluated at UT. And the prognosis wasn't great. Um, The news was not good at all. They all had severe pneumonia uh, in both of their lungs, except for Betsy Ross bear. Betsy Ross only had 
pneumonia in one lung. The re- they all did have those throat lesions, that thick oral discharge we saw with flapjack, and vets at this point are beginning to make hypotheses and suspect that this is a single colony bacterial infection. However, of course, we have to wait for testing and cultural cultures to to um, solidify that hypothesis. And this is uh, Martha Washington, I believe, in this picture getting checked out. So the next day, Thumper was successfully trapped this time, taken to UT, also positive for some sort of bacteria colony and pneumonia. However, he wasn't in in as bad of shape. His oxygen levels were in the high 90s. Tamale was actually in the worst shape with oxygen levels in the 60s, I believe, 64, 62, 64. I can't remember the exact number. So Tamale was the worst out of the rest of them that were... um, behind after flapjack flapjack was obviously the worst um he was showing signs clinically while the other ones were not quite yet showing those clinical signs of heaving or wheezing that we were seeing on cameras but again so um so thumper was not as worse off as the others at first so after they were all taken to the vet Similarly, they had their lungs drained, that mucousy discharge drained. They all got radiographs. They all got blood samples, urine samples. They all received oxygen and also had um, a nebulizer for a while to kind of break up that mucus in their lungs. Sent back to our facility and were ordered to be confined and on a four-week dose of antibiotics. So, of course, as you can imagine, bears that size don't love to be confined, and that's hard to keep them confined and not stressed. So the Cubs began their four-week healing journey. Tamale and Burrito brothers were housed in the Hartley house. Betsy and Martha sisters were housed in the Cub house, and Thumper was put in the acclimation pen of Wild Enclosure 3. We also purchased humidifiers, and veterinarians gave us gentamicin, which is a Uh, It is an antibiotic for bacterial infections. I have some notes here, so I don't forget um, some of these medications. And that gentamicin was added to all of the humidifiers, which were in all of the areas where the sick cubs were. And we would change the water and add that gentamicin um, into those humidifiers daily. So the next day on October 10th, This is the morning where we woke up and found that Burrito Bear had unfortunately passed in the night. Burrito was taken for necropsy, and this is when things really started to feel panicky. This is when I pretty much dropped everything I was doing at home um, and drove down to Tennessee. I got in at like 1130 at night. It was just a lot of unknowns. We didn't know what the bacteria was. We didn't know if it was zoonotic. We didn't know if it could spread to other wildlife. We didn't know if it could spread to the other bears. We didn't know if all of them were going to die. It was very scary. And so this is the time when we all kind of really were itching for answers. This is a picture of Brito and Tamale cuddling um, in some of the last few days together that they had. And um, this was a really hard passing because Tamale was really the worst off cub out of all of them, not just his brother Burrito, um, but in terms of clinically, his oxygen levels were really poor. His lungs did not look great. And so it was really surprising to us that burrito kind of took a turn, um, took a turn and ended up being the one that passed. So same day, October 10th, veterinarians were able to um, graciously come out the same day and visit our facility to check on the remaining bears. The decision was made not to immobilize anyone at that time. They were going to decide that once they got into these buildings, saw the bears for themselves, listened to the coughing, listened to the wheezing, and decide if it was if they were comfortable immobilizing them. They sounded so bad that they were not comfortable immobilizing them. And so at that time, um, again, they didn't immobilize them. They pretty much just uh, visually checked them and then also assigned some more uh, medicine to their to their long lineup here. So they added some steroids. They did add a dewormer. I think two of the cubs maybe when they had their thorough exam, um, there were worms in a, in a fecal sample possibly. Um, as many of you know, we do deworm all the bears that come to our facility. That's just something that it's another thing their body's fighting off at the time. And so if we can help clear that parasite that might be helpful. Um, They also prescribed some meloxicam, which is an anti-inflammatory, and then vitamin C 
um, was also added to their daily lineup. And then this is uh, this is a picture of tamale bear. So the next day, uh, Thumper is starting to not handle his confinement well. So we've lost two bears at this point, Burrito, Flapjack. Thumper is in acclimation pen three, and he is pacing, pacing a lot. Um, he's very, very stressed, and he's just not handling his confinement very well. Veterinarians also do a walkthrough at our facility in enclosure four to try and collect samples of anything that might look off. Again, we have no idea yet of the origin of this um, and still don't know if it's bacteria or viral. You can see everyone's wearing masks and booties and uh, gloves to be really safe, but they went in there, um, did sort of a thorough walkthrough to see if there was anything off um, and took some samples as well. The next day on October 12th, Thumper stops eating and stops taking his antibiotics because his antibiotics are in his food. He's still in acclimation pen three. And historically, Thumper was a really good eater. I think in one of our posts, um, when we first posted about him, we were we were very confident that he, you know, he's a good eater, he'll eat anything, and weren't worried about him taking his antibiotics. But as you can see, he stopped eating and was refusing his antibiotics. At this time, we had opened the door from the acclimation pen into Wild Enclosure 3 so that he had access um, because he was so stressed, but he was still, we were still baiting him into the acclimation pen to get his food and his antibiotics, which he was not interested in. Our other cubs are still um, exhibiting clinical signs, very wheezy, coughing. Um, and at this point, vets did give get some um, testing back, and it showed that there is no evidence of this being a fungal origin, a viral origin, or a waterborne illness. So it really leaves us with their first hypothesis of some sort of bacteria. And then on the 13th, we finally, um, we get a name to this bacteria and it is a, it tests their cultures all tested positive for a streptococcus gallinaceous infection. And I wanted to include this um, because I think this speaks really greatly to, to us telling you all that there's not a lot known about this. You can see that this um, was published in the Journal of Nation National Medical in 2023, so this year, and it says streptococcus gallinaceous infection, a new breed of zoonotic streptococcus. So that leaves us kind of feeling like, great, <laughs> we know more, but we still, there's still not a ton out there. Um, it's it's usually a strain of strep found in gall gallinaceous birds, so things like poultry, chickens, um, the very little research that is on it says that aerosolization contamination of streptococcus gallinaceus, the risk is very low. So that's good, good news in terms of spreading to the other enclosures as well as to curators. Um, and so we don't, we know more, but we still don't know a lot. We do know that the bacteria um, type that we're treating for with the antibiotics we're giving the cubs is the right kind right off the bat. And so um, we don't have to make any changes to their antibiotics and they're already on the right course for treatment. Um, so we know a little bit more. And again, there's not a lot about streptococcus gallinaceus, definitely in bears, but in wildlife in general. Um, it has been, uh, they know it's zoonotic. So it has been detected in, um, I think, a person in the UK. Um, I say a person because, again, it's that that new and that, um, that unknown. Um, there's one paper I could find about someone having it. And then, um, again, chickens or poultry. So our next step um, is to, we were in contact with the state Tennessee Health Department. We were supposed to provide a list of anyone who has been in contact with the sick bears, which we did, as well as explain to them all the different PPE measures we were taking. Again, those masks, gloves, and booties, um, also disinfecting our boots. And then we were starting to try and brainstorm the origin of this bacteria. Um, again, if we're thinking chickens, we don't feed our bears chickens. Um, there are no chickens around. It's not really something found in wild birds like avian influenza. Um, and so some some origins or some I ideas we had for origins were we were getting the chicken baby food that we sometimes feed the really younger cubs, getting that tested. Um, 
very unlikely that that was the origin. And then we also got to thinking about Martha and Betsy, who are here in this picture the day they were trapped. They were the last bears to enter that enclosure, Wild Enclosure 4, on July 4th of 2023. And their reasoning for being orphaned was because their mother was shot by a landowner for eating their chickens. And so that's really the only other poultry connection that we could think okay. of at the time. And so um, that origin, again, is being considered, looked into, but really don't have any strong leads other than we know that that is the bacteria. So we're now on to October 16th. Thumper is still not thriving, not eating his uh, food, his antibiotics. So he's relocated to the Hartley house. Uh, the vets were there at that time to give him, they did give him a shot of antibiotics since he wasn't consuming his antibiotics. And we did relocate him to the Hartley house to be with Tamale, who is also now alone. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of them. This was the night that we reunited them. This is Thumper here, um, just straight cuddling onto, onto Molly. Um, it's very, very sweet. Uh, Thumper was always a very social bear. Bears at this age are social, so it's not odd. I had a lot of questions I saw pop up um, from folks during this time about his, his behavior of wanting to be social. And Black bears at this age would normally still be with their siblings and their mother. And so the fact that he was with these sort of faux siblings or these um, uh, these sub sub in siblings, if you will, while he's here at our facility, and then all of a sudden they were gone. Um, bears are really smart. Bears are very intelligent. Uh, and so we think he was kind of going through it with with all of a sudden being locked in an acclimation pen, having no one else there. And so we really hoped that this normal socialization with another cub would help encourage him to eat and take his medicine. And then for a couple days, it's quiet. Um, the girls at the cub house, Martha and Betsy here, we gave them access to the acclimation pen as well. Um, they did some pacing as well. So you can see we tried to cover up all of the visuals that they had to the, to the outside enclosure. But everyone seems to be improving. There's less wheezing going on. There's less, less um, coughing going on when curators are down there. And so all is kind of quiet for now. On the 21st, Thumper's condition worsens. Uh, Curator Bailey noticed on cameras, uh, again, sort of what we saw with Flapjack I showed you earlier, really just heavy breathing. Um, breathing we didn't notice in days prior. So it was sort of a um, something that was getting worse. I have here nine days missed of antibiotics, but that's not true. What I meant to say here, oops, um, what I meant to say was nine days missed of of sort of con um, continuous eating. He was not eating well. He did get a shot of antibiotics. He wasn't eating his oral antibiotics for about that nine days. He probably was getting a little bit when he would eat a little bit, but he really wasn't interested in eating all that much at all. So veterinarians, again, at the drop of a hat, came the same day, made a trip to ABR. We're so thankful for them. He got another antibiotic injection. They gave him some pain medicine. They also gave him some anxiety medicine. Um, and then they gave him an appetite stimulant to try and encourage his eating as well as encourage more of that um, those oral antibiotics. The next day, um, he had a little bit more interest in eating. He continued to find comfort in being with Tamale. They even kind of play, I wouldn't say played, like we're used to seeing them wrestle, but they batted around a little bit. Um, he did show interest in an enrichment item. So he he seemed to kind of show more, show more interest. And um, you can see here again, uh, all buddies with Tamale. Next day, Thumper's condition um, kind of just took a turn again for the worst veterinarians had done at that point everything that they knew to do for him and they were really worried that the bacteria could have gotten into his bloodstream and gone septic. Um, they did when they had examined him two days prior try and drain any mucus from his lungs. There still wasn't much coming out and so that made them think that potentially this bacteria had kind of spread larger um, and so the very difficult decision was made to uh, put Thumper to sleep. And he was our third and final bear that we lost during this. 
So then for the rest of the month, from the 24th to the 31st, uh, carriers worked really hard to begin cleaning and disinfecting wild enclosure number four um, in preparation for the follow-up exam of the last um, three bears who were supposed to be seen on November 1st. We did know from at least knowing what kind of bacteria this was that this is not does not sp spread well through aerosolization. It also doesn't last long on things or items. So um, the the life of it, you know, hanging out on the cubby pool rim or anything like that, um, it just would not last, which is good news. But also we wanted to be really um, thorough in cleaning and disinfecting after this whole debacle, as you can imagine. So here's Carrier Haley working really, really hard, scrubbing this cubby pool, which was very dirty um, after all of the bears in there all year. They cleaned the pool thoroughly. They also burned um, all the platforms, the tops of them, as well as right underneath them, where there tends to be a lot of bear scat and bear urine. And so they burned as much of the enclosure as they could to try and kill anything else off um, as well. And so that took a, a lot of work and a lot of time. Then finally, on November 1st, the Cubs had successfully completed their course of antibiotics and the follow-up ex exams were performed. And all good news, veterinarians performed a variety of tests. They did radiographs to compare to the first radiographs. They did EKGs, ultrasounds of their lungs as well as their hearts. They also did endotracheal washes and took blood samples because after Thumper, they were concerned about any sort of sepsis. And so they wanted to make sure that the bacteria wasn't present at all in their bodies, but also especially in any of their blood. And it was not. Um, but this is a video. I think there is sound. What we're seeing here is you can see this is uh, Betsy Ross bear. They're looking at the blood flow uh, in her heart to see and make sure that all the valves are working correctly. In the limited research and literature that we could find about this specific strain of strep, it did cause stress on um, the hearts, the hearts of chickens, as well as the one uh, male that there was a paper about of it spreading to a person zoonotically. And so they wanted to check on their hearts and make sure that there was no permanent damage. So yeah, I'm not a cardiologist. I can't tell you much more than that, but the colors represented the, the, the blood flows um, and all looked really, really well with those tests. They were very pleased. And so that same day, once everybody awoke from being sedated, Tamale was reunited with Betsy Ross and Martha Washington, who he previously had shared an enclosure with. And they shared the Cub House as well as Acclamation Pen 4 together until we got the final test results back, which they did have to wait and grow that, that bacteria culture and see if the bacteria showed back up or not. During this wait, uh, the deep cleaning and disinfection began for indoor buildings at ABR. So um, the Hartley House, you can see they're working really hard on that in this picture. Scrubbed head to toe. Um, they also had our HVAC system company, Roger Newman Heating and Air from Maryville. They came out and professionally cleaned our HVAC systems, both in the Cub House and the Hartley House, once everything was said and done and um, cleaned. I don't know much about it, but they were able to clean through it so that um, if there was any lingering bacteria or germs throughout the HVAC system, it was completely disinfected and cleaned, which is absolutely amazing. And they did that for free for us. They have been so good to um, our, our organization as a whole. So shout out to them and thank you again. Um, they're a local company in Maryville, but a lot of uh, backbreaking work in cleaning and disinfecting. And again, it's zoonotic. So though it doesn't stay and stick to surfaces, masks, gloves, booties, being really careful about disinfecting our boots, all of our protocols really were re-examined. And then November 9th, this is such a good day and I, my video might be covering it, but this is day I counted back. This is day 37 from our day zero we started this program at. Day 37, Tamali, Martha, and Betsy 
their cultures came back and were negative for the bacteria infection that they previously were positive for. And they were able to be returned outside into wild enclosure four. And that's where they are today. Um, doing really well out there. We haven't seen any clinical signs of any other issues, breathing well, playing, sleeping. Um, those three are continuing to uh, do well outside. So at present, um, just to kind of conclude what we know now, um, the tissue culture. So Martha and Betsy's mom, when she was uh, killed by that landowner for eating chickens, they did have a couple tissue samples of her saved and frozen at UTCVM. Uh, they took those out, sawed them, and then tested those samples for the same strep bacteria. Again, thinking maybe that could be the origin of from where this is. It did not grow, this strep bacteria. However, that does not mean that she did not have it. That just means that those exact tissue samples that they had from her didn't have it there. And so that's kind of where we're left, unfortunately, because we don't have any more samples to test. Um, so inconclusive, but that's that's our best leads to this day of the origin of where this could have came from. This is a non-reportable uh, disease with the CDC. So it's unlikely that they'll con that anybody will continue or try to follow up with where those bears were eating chickens at. And veterinarians are also now starting to wonder if this is more prevalent than we think out in wildlife populations. Um, and we just didn't know about it before. The likelihood of us knowing about this, if a sow or a cub or a yearling died from something like this out in the wild is really, really low. One, because we wouldn't know to test for it. Two, testing wildlife for diseases like this. Again, we didn't even know that this was a disease that bears could get. Um, and so they're kind of thinking now in communications with the vets that this might be more prevalent. Black bears might carry it. But because black bears are mostly um, solo individuals and don't gather in groups, um, that them spreading it in the wild isn't like a spreading wildfire like we might see with something like CWD and deer. This is all completely... Um, hypothesizing again, because we don't have any concrete answers, but this is um, just us kind of, kind of speaking our thoughts out loud, um, our educated guesses. And this kind of brings up the, the downsides of wildlife rehabilitation. So while bears normally would be with their siblings and their mother at this time of year, you know, there probably wouldn't be eight, there wouldn't be eight bears that are unrelated and sometimes from different states in an enclosure licking each other, snuggling together. And so these are all things that we as a rehab facility take into con careful consideration. A couple of years ago when the wildfires were really bad in California, we had multiple conversations with the wildlife department in California about the potential for taking any bears if needed. And it was ultimately decided that it'd be way more realistic to send our some of our curators to California to help spread our knowledge and get them set up uh, there somewhere out of the danger with fire danger. Um, because bringing bears from that far away that wouldn't necessarily cross state lines to our facility, again, we, we run into that um, concern for disease and spread of disease. So we have taken a lot of um, hard looks at our protocols, our procedures, what we can do in the future to prevent anything like this happening. And again, if it is more prevalent than we think in the population, um, that's just something that we and wildlife managers and veterinarians would not have known um, ahead of time. And bears normally wouldn't come into as close contact as our bears, unfortunately. <clears throat> And so at present, um, you know, I'll end with the second thing we're thankful for, besides all of you and your wonderful support in many ways, is that we have Tamali and Martha and Betsy, and they're set to be released still. Um, everything with them was checked off. They got the green light. If everything continues the way that it is, um, veterinarians and wildlife officials don't see any reason to keep them in captivity longer than needed. Um, you know, all their lungs were checked, their hearts were checked for any damage. I think their lungs are expected to have a little bit of damage because if you have severe pneumonia, it can cause long-term damage, but nothing that's going to stop them from living a wild bear life, climbing trees. Um, and so we're really thankful for 
them and that we have them still. And of course, all of you and your support at this time. So at present, what we're doing is really trying to recover. Um, like I said, looking back on all of that, it feels like a whirlwind, like we were kind of just taken through a tornado and then dropped out, spit out on the other end. Um, we do have an, a very large outstanding balance at UT, as you can imagine, and I can't express our thankfulness for the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine, which we've you know, talked about on live before. We welcomed them on live. They've just been absolutely amazing through all of it. Um, just the most gracious and caring people. So very, very thankful for them. Um, but you can see our balance here. This is, um, this is from Twinkle's bill. So the invoice, uh, total here, this 591, that's from Twinkle, uh, our newest intake, her intake exam. And then that was added to, you can see here, our outstanding balance. We've had a couple people ask about the, the veterinary bills. So I wanted to be transparent and share that with you all. Um, Two thirds of our 2023 veterinary expenses for the facility uh, are basically chalked up to this outbreak. Before the outbreak, we had spent $24,134.29 at UTCVM. We had quite a few other sort of weird um, clinical medical things earlier in the year. Many of you might remember cranberry, a lot of bears with um, seemingly some joint issues. And so, uh, that was before this outbreak. And then now you can see after this outbreak, about $16,646. Um, so about two thirds of our 2023 expenses came from this outbreak. And then a really important tip around this season of giving is that about half of our operating budget as an organization comes during funds that we're able to raise during our winter campaign, as well as Giving Tuesday. Um, so a lot rides on sort of this end of the year fundraising for us and Giving Tuesday is coming up. So I just wanted to kind of do a shout out and remind everyone about Giving Tuesday. Um, if you're not in a place financially to give, we'd love if you would just share our campaign link with your friends or your family. Again, all of your support through all of this non-financially has been absolutely amazing and financially has been absolutely amazing. So thank you guys so much. Um, I hope this kind of gives everyone a a broad scope of what the last month has been like, which I know many of you are, knew what it was like, but kind of just recapping it all and having it in order, I think is um, very helpful, especially for us historically. This was really helpful to me to kind of get our records in order and, and remember what happened in what order in case we ever do face anything near as horrible as this in the future you know, wanting to learn from what happened and hopefully prevent it from happening again. So thank you all so much. We're so, so thankful for you and your time and your thoughts and your comments. All of it does not go unnoticed. If you didn't get a response, an email response or anything from us, um, it doesn't mean we didn't read it. All of your comments meant the world to us. I'm going to read these comments real quick and see if there's any... Uh, Any questions here? Has this been determined that the virus was contagious due to close contact? Janet, yes. So very similar to how strep in humans uh, spreads. There's a, there's a lot of different um, strains of strep, which is something I've learned through all of this. You know, I've had strep before in my life, the typical strep that you would expect humans to get. Um, and so very similar to that, very close contact, um, saliva, mucus. And so you can imagine our bears, um, you know, they're licking each other's faces and their mouths and they're, they're sharing the same drinking tub and they're sometimes grabbing apples from each other. And so that really close contact and especially mouth to mouth and nose to nose contact um, was why it was able to spread throughout one enclosure at our facility and impact um, those bears so drastically. Yeah, Julie, yep, 100%. Uh, so yes, UTCVM, the veterinarians will absolutely write at least one. I would not be surprised if more came, um, came out due to this. They're um, waiting for more reports to come back. Like I said, we haven't gotten um, some necropsy 
results back yet. So there's a lot we still are waiting on. Some of those things take months because they're sent out to other labs. And so I'm sure that the paper will take a while to write and then to publish and um, be in a journal, but it absolutely will be written up and um, shared to other professionals, not only in the veterinary field, but also the wildlife field and wildlife rehabilitation field for others to know about and uh, learn about. It looks like that's all of our questions. Thank you all so much for your patience with the Zoom uh, mishap earlier. Uh, we will be back with you. I Oh, um, our next program, December 5th, we are actually going to use that night for our bare necessities. So for those of you who've attended bare necessities before, this is a presentation program we put on every year to kind of honor our bears through the year. And it's sort of a Christmas celebration of, of our cub class for 2023. We're going to host it. We usually host it on Giving Tuesday. However, because of everything I just presented in this program, we feel like we're really scrambling on getting caught up with everything, to be honest with you. We're a pretty small staff, and so a lot of things are the bear care came first and foremost. And so a lot of these other things where we feel like we're trying to scramble to get together, especially towards the end of the year, it gets so busy. Um, so we did push that back by a week, which would put us at Tuesday, December 5th. Um, we decided we're going to send the link to all of our members, all of our recurring donors, and then also anyone who donates to our um our uh, winter campaign. So if you've donated, obviously, if you're watching this, you're a member, so you'll receive a link. And that's what we'll be doing for our next program. And our last program of the year, which will be December 19th, I believe, uh, Curator Bailey will be here and present for you all. So thank you so much again for your time and your support. And I hope you guys have a really safe and happy, healthy Thanksgiving. Thank you.